Welcome back to Venshon Denshon, my YouTube channel. And today's guest is Andrew Joy, who now I want to get the number of years right, but I won't. But it was some 30 or 40 years as solo horn in the Westdeutsche Rundfunk. And I'm sure Andrew will correct me. And an inspiration to many, um, not just Australian players, but horn players from all around the world. And Andrew, it's fantastic to have you here. So let me, let's sort that out. How long were you principal horn in the Westdeutsche Rundfunk for? Um, I was uh, on first horn there for 32 years. 32 years, wow. Yeah. And I've got a lot of, I've, I've looking at your, um, your website and communicating with you, I've got a whole bunch of things I want to dig into. But I'm going to start with my, it's now getting, people know it too well, so they prepare, but I don't mind. In your long career playing the horn, just a few of the really memorable concerts and why they're memorable to you. Yeah. Well, I checked that out, I'll be honest, and had to think about it. And I'll pick out three, one at the very beginning, one on the way through, and one pretty much at the end. The first one, I had three important cello players in my life that had a major, major influence on my career. And the first one uh, used to sit next to me in the Air Force Association Band in Perth playing tenor horn. And he was a teacher at my school, but not one of my teachers. And one day he asked me if I was interested in playing the French horn, which I'd heard about and knew from Reader's Digest records and loved the sound of in the Eroica. Um, he said this orchestra in Fremantle, Fremantle Youth Orchestra would buy an instrument if they could get somebody to play it. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I had no idea what I was letting myself in for because I found sort of afterwards that switching from a normal brass instrument to French horn was like getting off a, a, a kid's car with uh, four wheels onto a, a, um, a uni bike. And later on in my career, getting onto natural horn, baroque horn was like getting onto a two, three meter uni bike. So uh, yeah, anyway, so he asked me about that. I ended up with this Boozy and Hawks um, pea shooter, we call them, a single horn with crooks, piston valves, markings on the, on the tuning slides for, for the different keys. And I had no idea, no teacher, we had three months to figure out that the fingerings for the scale stay the same, but when you change the tubing, you have a different pitch. So like having the different strings on, on, on an instrument. Anyway, we, uh, we practiced and then the concert came and then two trombone players came and they only came for the concert. And uh, they had fun sitting behind me, one bell in each of my ears and it just destroyed me. It completely destroyed me. I didn't get a foot on the ground. And so I've had a thing for the rest of my life about trombone players sitting behind me. <laughs> and actually when I started working in Cologne, as soon as I was out, out of my, uh, my uh, probation time, the first thing I did was move the horn group from in front of the trombones over to the other side of the orchestra and we stayed there. <laughs> I'm gonna. I just have to tell you why I'm laughing about that. I'm gonna just inject one little story because I also had a deep, deep, not discomfort. I couldn't do it with the trombones behind me. And once in the tour hall, when we were trying out new seatings, they wanted to try it out. When it came to the one with the tour hall behind me, I just pretended I couldn't play. I just could not deal with it at all. So I, I hear you loud and clear. But back to Perth. Back to Perth. Yeah, well, actually, when you mention it like that, um, I was in a in Cologne in a concert with um, Chicago doing Heldenleben, and the horns, nine of them, were sitting in front of the brass. And the problem with it, especially in that hall also, is that the horn bell is down, the trombone bell's up, and the trumpet bells, and something gets cancelled out with the horn sound, and you don't hear them in, in the hall. You literally don't hear it. And we had that issue also with recording. So... There were, there were other factors involved there as well. On the way through, my oldest son, Chris, who'll, who'll turn 40 this year, pretty soon in June, um, was the inspiration for a concerto written by a friend of mine who, who died way too early. He was 58 when he died. A German composer, Hans-Georg Pfluger. Pfluger 
played many, many concerts on the organ and piano together with Herman Bauman. And he learned a lot about the instrument, about the horn from Herman Bauman and wrote fantastic pieces for him. And I got introduced over, an, uh, over another cellist who was uh, a major influence in my, my career, Johannes Skoritsky. He introduced me to a concerto from Fluger. So over the years, this friendship developed. And long story short, Fluger wrote a con concerto for me uh, along the lines of the Britain, but very, very different. So it's for tenor, singer, horn, strings, and percussion. And he used text out of a diary from um, an autistic German who lives in Berlin, who was a young man then. And this young man, Birger Zerlin, learned to type at the computer with a method that came out of Melbourne, Australia, called facilitated communication. And a woman, yeah, a woman in Melbourne, Rosemary Crossley, developed that. That's also a long story. Anybody who's interested should check out Rosemary Crossley and a book, Annie's Coming Out. Fascinating, because one of my colleagues also brought that book from Australia to me, and it changed our family life with Chris and with eating and this kind of thing. So it's all intertwined, this one piece. And uh, so Hans Georg, uh, we got talking and I asked him, is, uh, yeah, he asked me if there are books that I could give him. So I did. And we got talking about it and I asked him if it was a problem for him because he stuttered really badly. If he hadn't stuttered, he would have become a composition professor in Germany somewhere. And yeah, so we got into some really deep, interesting conversations about it all. And then later on, when we we're doing the rehearsals for the premiere performance, the concert master wasn't taking the piece seriously. Um, interesting listening to Hakan talk about new pieces and members of orchestras, first of all, because they don't understand it. It's a new language. So people tend to dismiss the music, first of all, and this was happening. And a woman who helped us care for Chris, she'd give us relief. She insisted that Chris go to the premiere performance. She said, without Chris, there wouldn't have been this piece. And I said, we can't because it's being recorded and he's loud. He, you, you, you can't keep him quiet. So she said, good, he's got to come to the dress rehearsal. So she came with Chris to the dress rehearsal and Chris was sitting at the back with her watching and he'd get moments where he's, his tension build up and he relieved that by biting on his hand. He's like, oh, like this. Some of the women in the orchestra understood all of a sudden what some of the noises were that they had to make because they were seeing Chris. It was really interesting. And then he'd get agitated, they'd go for a walk, they'd come back, he'd eat something, he'd get, oh, and this again, this kind of thing. But because of it, the women got together in the break, they talked about what they were seeing in that and what they had understood now, what this piece was about, also the text and the major, the major Botschaft, the major, what's a Botschaft? Message. Um, message. The major message of the piece, it's a universal one, is that even people <clears throat> or even someone who can't speak still has something to say. And the universalness of it is that we all find ourselves in our lives at times, like in a relationship or with our kids or with colleagues or whatever, we find ourselves in a situation where it'd be good if we could speak, if we could say no, or if we could explain something and we can't, we're speechless. Some people never speak in their lives, like my son, which is kind of hard as a father, but anyway, there was this about it. And so these women got together and they understood what was going <laughs> and they just zoomed in on this guy and basically mobbed him and said, you know, get your act together, which he did. And then the following day was the premiere performance and it turned out to be really fantastic. We got a really good recording out of it. And um, it's a piece that's still waiting for horn players to take up and introduce into the repertoire. But listening to Hakan, it's, it's a piece, I think, also that will stand the test of time. So at the actual premiere, we, um, we played the Britain Serenade, first of all, and then a piece for strings, and then, then the fluger. The tenor talked about the Britain, 
and Johannes Skoritsky, the conductor, talked about, uh, I think it was Bartok. And then I talked about Hans Georg's piece. And, and I was talking more than about people with handicap and, and what, what I had experienced in my life, being involved with a school and this kind of thing. Um, uh, um, a, an association here, Lebensheil, for um, uh, uh, an association that helps people with handicapped family members. And when I started talking, uh, I lasted maybe about a minute and a half and I suddenly lost my voice. <laughs> it really got to me talking about these people. And I sort of froze and I went, you know, inside you're going, God, what's going to happen now? And so I pulled myself together and I said, sorry, I'm losing my voice. We'll just play it. And then there was like, Jesus, Andrew, what's going to happen now? You know? And it was really amazing because there was like a switch inside of me. It just went woof like that. And all of a sudden, it wasn't a private person talking anymore. It was the professional horn player who had something to deliver. And I just switched into a totally different mindset. Off we went. And, and it was quite amazing. And for that concert, uh, just to tie it up, I'd been working on a triple horn that I wanted with my instrument maker, Dieter Otto. He'd finally finished it, and I actually wanted it for that piece because it has a, a range of four octaves and half a tone. It's, it's a huge range. And it would have made some of the stuff at the top end just that little bit easier to have had the sports car in the instrument, you know? <laughs> Um, and anyway, Dieter and Lottie, they came to the concert, which was fantastic. And after the concert, Dieter walked up to me and said, here's your horn. <laughs> so that was, the, yeah, that was the concert on the way through. And the last concert, basically, that I played was for um, an eye doctor's conference in Dusseldorf down the road. And a mate of mine here in Cologne asked me for it, if I was interested, and I I said yes, and then I regretted it because I was still, still <laughs> battling with focal dystonia, a kind of focal dystonia where you, you, you lose the access to the neural networks in your mind, the, the neural networks as a brass player that I'd built up over 40 odd years, 40, 50 years. Devastating, not, not a good place to be. And when I spoke with the professor about what to play, I didn't want to have any distractions. So I didn't want to do it with piano. He wanted a horn and piano thing. And somebody was being honored, given a uh, recognition. And so I was able to talk him into just doing two solo pieces. Um, the horn players will know them, horn lock <clears throat> and uh, laudatio. Pieces I'd played really many, 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 many times. And when I started practicing them again for this, it was like being a beginner. <laughs> Nothing worked. I couldn't get anything together. And now I'm thinking, oh, why did you do this? Why don't you just ring up and cancel? And I hung in. And the problem was that with this, this type of focal dystonia that I was battling, um, I was being hit with amygdala hijacks in concerts. So you'd be in the middle of playing and all of a sudden the amygdala would, would alarm, alarm, alarm. And it would just be like a, um, a Windows computer throwing up a blue screen. And you, you stand there and your hands are empty and you can just be as well prepared, be over the top of it as much as you like. All of a sudden, nothing happens. And I got scared of being scared about that then, this, this freeze thing coming in. Anyway, at that stage, I was reading three books, Evolve Your Brain by Joe Dispenza, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Murray Lee Adams, and Words That Change Minds by Shella Rose Shavit. And the three of them, they changed many, many things in my life. One of them was practicing in, in, in my box, and there was a, a section in the um, Laudatio. And he goes up to a written B flat for the horn. And I realized when I was practicing, I was asking myself, what's this going to be like today? How's this going to feel? 
uh, how many times they're going to be able to do it before my lips give out. And I realized they weren't particularly empowering questions. They weren't getting me further. They weren't helping me to develop what I was doing there. And so re referencing these books and what I'd been reading and thinking about, I asked myself the question, how can I experience this passage as being easy, effortless, and having an aura like when the sun came up in Kakadu National Park at Yellow Waters. It's a very spectacular and it's a very special kind of yellow light that morning. And then I played it again and I almost dropped the horn because I didn't believe <laughs> that it could be so easy. Everything here, nothing about me changed. I had the same body, the same instrument, the same everything. I just asked a different question and it seriously blew me out of the water. So when I recomposed myself, I played it again, but asked the question before. And I did it five or six times and it just wasn't tiring. And it was coming out and it sounded fantastic. And I'm like, oh, you're onto something here. When I got to the concert to play, I was sitting down and listening and there was the, the, the first guy talking was a Persian, not an Iranian, but a Persian who fled the country as a child with his parents and studied in uh, London. And he was a, an eye specialist operating on handicapped children's eyes, ones who can't wear glasses for whatever, if they've got, you know, whatever problems they've got, they can't wear glasses and they can't see. And he told some incredible stories. He, he's actually the man in my life that I've listened to who's had talk with the most empathy about other human beings that I've ever experienced from a male. And he told a little story about a girl, a four-year-old girl who came in and she was, you know, like there's some biting and they, they couldn't contain her and whatever. So they did their, their magic with her and got her eyes sorted out. And he said, she came back four months later for a control, for a checkup. She was sitting at a desk and she was painting and she was talking with her parents normally and all this kind of thing. And he, he really made the point about how distressed she was prior to the operation because she couldn't see anything in focus. It was just a blur. So she was in panic all the time because she couldn't get any order out of what she was seeing. So I was listening to this guy. And at some stage I thought, um, you know, you, you got to stop listening because you need to get your head together because you got to get up and play now. And in that moment, I felt this bar of fear across here. Horrific, <laughs> like really solid, intense fear. And uh, most people I've spoken with know that they, they get it somewhere at the front here, this fear feeling. And any of us who have had it and tried to push it away gotten up on stage, started playing, know that it comes at you and it gets you at some stage. And, and then you, you sort of, you've lost it. You drop the ball. So I knew I couldn't push it away. I had to do something different with it. And again, these books activated then a question that I had never used in that situation before. And the question, the question was, how can I use this energy to empower and enable me to deliver excellence now. <laughs> and this feeling here went book into a big smile. And the little voice in here is like, what's going on? Because that had completely gone. And then it came back and this happened six times. And then the guy had finished his, his presentation, the guest professor, uh, asked me to come up, introduce me and this kind of thing. And so I was working on that question, but also I've got some other techniques, a thing called EFT, emotional freedom technique, where you can tap and, and you can do it mentally as well, just to keep everything down. Also some breathing control exercises to keep my physiology down like this. <clears throat> he finished his thing and then I went in there and played Laudatio. And then when this passage came that had been seminal when I was practicing, there's a little comma before you do it. So I slipped the question in and played it. And I've never, ever in my life played it so well in public when it counted. And when I finished, I sat down and there was this feeling of, of relief. 
but also um, I have to say it like this, a feeling of joy as well, which was special for me. Of course. And then the, the guy who was being honored got up and gave his thing. And then towards the end of his, his speech, uh, this little voice came up again. He said, uh, Andrew, do you realize that you are way too relaxed to be going up there to play? You need to get yourself together. <laughs> so it was like the other end of this block of fear here. So I sat there and did a little bit of tapping or whatever else and, that, and got up and went up and did the horn lock and just had fun with it. And after it was over, this was, um, you know, the, the, in the morning, I drove back to Cologne from Dusseldorf and went back in the evening and sat with a group of these doctors and, and had a meal and talk with them, which was also fantastic. But on the way back from Dusseldorf to Cologne, I was driving, but I felt like I was sitting on a Persian carpet. And it was, it was like the, 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 the biggest breakthrough, the biggest success and the biggest feeling of satisfaction that I've ever had in my life to have overcome this seven, eight year drought. Wow. Thank you so much for all three of those, all three of those stories from your playing career. I think that people are going to listen, especially, well, actually all three, to be honest, all three, because there's so much that we could dig into, into all of them. And so many things that actually connect to me because um, the assisted, the, the assisted writing, I have a, a dear friend who uses that as his way of communicating and his mom, really? his mom puts a hand on his shoulder yeah, he's a he's a, an autistic friend of mine who's a who's written a beautiful book back from the brink. His name's Tim Chan. And oh, I need to get that. Yeah, I'll definitely I'll put I'll put the link in. I'll I'll tell you yeah, that. So hearing you talk about that, and also hearing your understanding that when he was biting down on his hand, that that's not a negative thing. That's that's actually that's a that's a that's a part of his regulation process, and that the connection that could be made to the violin players and then to the conductors, just that whole way, that positive synergy. I found that incredibly moving. And then when you talk so um, openly and I'm so I'm gonna use the word joyfully about your experience with the, the journey through the focal dystonia, which I've, um, I've been hearing a little bit about it by following Phil Smith's journey a little bit, of course. Uh -huh. And, um, hearing you tell that and the parallels that I see to my own process through my Chinese medicine and my martial arts of the this way of internal talk of the way of using it so we're definitely going to dive into those three books I want you to tell us more about those three books but actually I want to go back and I want to try and understand how does someone come from the Fremantle Youth Orchestra to being in the VDR, the the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, because when you would have joined the orchestra, I don't think there would have been that many Australians playing in German orchestras. There would have been, there wouldn't have been many. So how did you, how did that happen? Oh, there were a few. Um, I had, you know, you. I was listening to you with other interviews talking about your teachers and the influence they had on your life. Well, I've got a a lot of people like that also. And, and I mentioned three cellists. The second cellist was a guy called Brian Mediman who used to play in the, um, the Perth Symphony Orchestra and moved to Italy. And I, I, unfortunately, I never got to meet him before he died again. Uh, after I left Perth, we never saw one another again. And there was a there was a point, I did a lot of therapy at one stage and read a lot of uh, books and, and did a lot of personal growth work and that. And I realized one of the big things in life, nobody does it on their own. We're all, we're all connected and we all have people that help us. And this particular cellist, um, he didn't have to, he didn't have to do anything with me. Um, he was listening to practice one day and he said, oh, can you, can you come over to my place after school? So I went over to his place after school and he played me recordings. And one of them that I really remember is um, Brahms Double and uh, the Bach Cello Suites with Pierre Fournier. And it just blew me out of the water to hear that. And, and the, the horn and the cello, they're brother and sister, so to speak. 
And then he showed me long notes on the open strings on the cello and explained about the fundamental and the overtones and pushed me to hear an overtone rich sound and showed me that when he relaxed with his bow arm in a certain way and worked with gravity, um, and that's also a um, gravity is something that's accompanied my playing and learning all the way through, even now at the moment, it's very actual. I'm doing a course with some Canadian guys on feet and hips, and it's all about the body with gravity. Anyway, he's showing me this thing like that, and he could play on the open C string and make the fifth sound so strongly that his tuning machine switched to G. And he asked me, can you do that on the horn? Well, at the beginning, I couldn't do it, but I went away and, and I became obsessed with um, playing long notes. So I'd do it for an hour or two and I actually damaged my bottom lip one day by doing too much. Years later, like decades later, I realized though that that period of two, three years where I really went into, dove incredibly deep with, with um, playing long notes every day was the basis for the career because I got the job people told me in Cologne because of my sound. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense because, and that's the, yeah, that's, that, that's been the, the feature of my own playing and teaching. And of course, that's what I tell, I've been helping people prepare for auditions now. And that's what you've got. That's, that's the way that, you know, your sound and your articulation, of course, your musicality and everything, and your stylistic things. But if the, I'm going to say it, if the noise is not beautiful or resonant and rich and appropriate. And so I can imagine that that's, yeah. So you got the job in Cologne. Um, and what was it like? What was it, what was it like being in the, you would have been quite, were you quite young when you got your job in Cologne? What was that, yeah. what was that experience? Yeah, I, I started playing with the orchestra when I was 26. It was scary as all hell because when I hit Germany, I spoke no German. So when I was at the, at the music college here, having lessons from Erich Pencil for about nine months, um, one of the things that saved my skin was that I didn't understand the German that the German students were talking about. So I didn't catch the, what I call a virus, a fear virus about missing notes and all of this kind of thing. And I wasn't catching all the gossip about who was where and who was up and who was down and all this kind of thing. I missed it all. So I was really lucky with that. Um, by the time I got the job, it was after yeah two years that I, I could speak. I could understand a lot more um, than I could speak. And um, I remember the first concert I played was in Dusseldorf uh, for a trade fair with the orchestra or something, I don't know. And afterwards, everything here was like this. It felt like that and then I couldn't talk and I'm sitting in the bus on the way back to Cologne thinking, yeah, I'm going to use this word, you buggered before you even started. <laughs> and um, fortunately, it wasn't like that. But it, um, yeah, it was, it was scary because it's a fantastic orchestra. It's a very, very high standard. And I'd played in Bonn um, as first third horn for one and a half years prior to it. And prior to that, I played fourth horn in, in Melbourne. So I started playing first horn after the moment in life where I knew that I was mortal, I was gonna die one day. A lot of first horn players start when they're 17, 18, 19, 20, and they, they haven't caught it yet, that, you know? And so they're little Siegfrieds, little wonder gods. I was gonna say Siegfried, I was gonna say Siegfried. Yeah, 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 little Siegfrieds, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't that, when I started, I was like fully aware and, I had a coordinator colleague who just never missed. So the pressure was enormous. It was just really, really, I'm not that kind of player. Um, I wasn't, uh, yeah. And so the beginning, yeah, was, um, it was scary. And then I played all of the Bruckners, all of the Mahlers, um, Strauss, all of this stuff for the first time on first horn in that orchestra. So. For about the first seven years, I was basically eating, sleeping, and practicing and going to work. Eating, practicing, sleeping, and going to work. 
and then a family started and my oldest son being handicapped we had a lot of doctor's visits and this kind of thing and um actually when he was born the, the um oh, i can't think of his name the conductor uh we were in the middle of a rehearsal and one of the orchestral guys came in um and said, uh, there's a phone call for you from the uh, from the hospital. And I asked the conductor, can I take it? And when I came back in, he said, what was it? And he said, oh, I said to him, you know, um, um, they've rung and they said that they're going to do cesarean. And if I want to be there, uh, I need to be there inside an hour. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing here? Get out, get out, get out, go. <laughs> And he was there for the next two births, also conducting the orchestra. So with the third one, I said to him, um, maybe, maybe don't come back for a while. Oh, he was a guest conductor. Yeah, Foster. That was his name. Oh, Foster. Larry Foster. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I worked with him in Lausanne in the chamber. In the yeah, Lausanne yeah, yeah. Room. Great guy. Great yeah, sense yeah. of humor. Great <laughs> sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, I, I think you've, hinted a little bit at some of the um not therapy but the the self-enrichment some of the things you've done i if you're comfortable sharing i'd love to hear a little bit about your journey into that or power yeah, form playing or even even separately i'd like i'm really interested to know the things that you've um the things that you've explored and maybe if you want to share the some of the major lessons you've learned from them leaning our way yeah. up to these three books maybe yeah uh, I didn't have it easy in the orchestra. Being a foreigner, being successful, um, this is my take on it. Other people have a different take, but my take was that generated quite a bit of envy and uh, I didn't play an Alexander Horn. I played a Dieter Otto, it was a German instrument also. But um, so I was a bit of an outsider and I took a lot of heat and um, I've got something very stubborn in me that came from growing up in the West Australian bush. Um, something about not giving up. And my passion for, for decades was, it's changed now, but my passion was really playing the horn. I was just absolutely absorbed with it, obsessed with it and finding out how to do it better and studying all the great players. Um, Barry Tuckle was my big idol, but all the other great players as well. Anytime I went to a concert and I heard somebody doing something that I couldn't do, it was like, how do they do it? And if I got the opportunity, I'd go and ask them. Not only horn players, but other brass players, string players, pianists. Um, we had a, a Russian soloist once and he played this encore. And at the end, he went from the very bottom end of the piano chromatically up to the top end doing this amazing fortissimo to disappearing three pianos and the last note you could still hear it but it was something like when light is pivoting between being a wave and being a particle it was wow. <laughs> it was in there you know and and i was just blown away so i asked this guy how do, how do you do that and he said it's a feeling you listen and it's a feeling. And it was a, a really big indicator, I think, for what we do, um, getting out of thinking about things too much and listening a lot, lot more and, and building up feelings for stuff. Yeah. So on the way through, I think one of the major things, I, I work with this guy um, doing a thing called rebirthing, where you do breathing, special type reading stuff in water and whatever. And we did a lot of sessions together, not in water, just, just like therapy sessions, if you like. And it helped me get rid of a, um, a lot of aggression inside of myself, um, stuff that had come out of my childhood, but stuff that I picked up as an adult, all this kind of thing, um, taught me a lot about forgiveness. And then I came to him once and I'd, I'd done, I'd gotten really, comfortable playing the baroque horn and some of the literature some of the bark stuff is tricky on the baroque horn I always had to practice two weeks to be able to do it well in a concert and on a modern high f horn i'd need half an hour and i'd be chopping it out the same way so it's re really much much more difficult on the baroque horn at least the one i had and i came to him and i said to him you know we did this bark cantata and and the the text in there humans are sinners and all this kind of thing and i don't really like that and he said to me wait, you're, you're 
an important medium. And with your breath, this energy, you can put messages out into the audience. And it was really a seminal moment for me because I went home and thought about it and I changed everything I did, all of my practice. So over all the years, I did a, um, um, a long tone practice pattern of playing two seconds, resting, playing two seconds, resting, playing eight with crescendo, decrescendo, having a lot of control, four rest, then half a tone up, starting in the middle ridge, then going right up as far as I could, and then going right down to the bottom, doing the same thing. So I just used to play it. When I'd had this session with this guy afterwards, I changed that. So I was playing, I love myself, I love myself. I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. I acknowledge myself, I approve of myself, I forgive myself. I put all these affirmations in there and I did the same with all of my flexibility exercises. And um, again with Fluger, when I started practicing his concerto, I just couldn't make head nor tail of it. And that starts with a cadenza and I wrote a text out then about the emotional pain that I was feeling about my now wife, who I knew at that stage was going to become my wife, but she didn't. And she wasn't playing hard to get. She was being clever trying to avoid me, but <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden though, this piece was easy to play. So out of that one session with this therapist, I started writing out so, um, text for all of the solos I played. So for the fifth Tchaikovsky, I had one where I sang um, a love song to my wife, which was, I love you, darling. I love you dearly. I love you more, more and more as time goes by. And it went on like that. Or a, a fourth Bruckner. I am the king. I love myself. I love you all. Blah, blah. So, <clears throat> and it's, it changed playing for me. It changed the profession because like with the Bruckner, you sit on stage, you need a slow pulse to play that really well. You don't want this going on. You don't have the control. So you've got to find some way of taking control over your mind and not having the mind run riot. It's part of being a musician. And in those kinds of situations on first horn, <clears throat> and there's a few of them for us, you sit there, the conductor starts, he's doing this, and you're supposed to be able to hear the strings, but it's so soft, there's almost nothing there. And it's like you just, you, you, you're in this void, in this darkness, this black, and then all of a sudden the light goes on. And if you miss that first note, everybody hears it. And if there's this fear to overcome of missing, you have to get your mind geared up for, I'm gonna nail it. <clears throat> and what I found was having, having these texts then for all of these solos, I didn't even think about being scared. I mean, your pulse goes up a little bit, but you, you, you're thinking you've got it under control because you're focused on putting a message out. And the, the, the most incredible experience I had with that was preparing the fifth Marla for a recording with Gary Bertini and then performing it six months later in Japan. And um, this is not to put anybody down or to put myself above people or anything like that. But at that stage in my life, having been to Japan many, many times and observed the society, I thought one of their issues, uh, maybe in the context of the therapy I was doing also, was um, I, I wanted to tell the people it's safe for you to love one another, meaning also it's safe to show it and to, you know. So I practiced all the solos in the fifth mala with this message, it's safe for you to love one another, thinking of the Japanese. On the first recording day, one of my colleagues stood up and he turned around, we'd finished and I was just twiddling for the next day. <clears throat> and he said to me, excuse me, um, it's incredible how you're playing. You know, it's, it's like you're telling a story. It's like you're talking to us. And then he said, it's like Jesus talking to the masses. And my throat went, you know, it was like, Argh! and it scared the hell out of me to hear that. I had no idea. 
little guy, fantastic musician, fantastic oboist, and he was our principal oboe, Japanese. Wow. Later, yeah. Later in Japan, and it, it really, it really smacked him. Really smacked him. In Japan, we did it, I think, five concerts, and of the five concerts, after three of them, there were a, a pair of Japanese women waiting for me each time different people I'd never met before in different cities. And one of them had been in the audience listening and had asked the other one to translate for her. And they were very, you know, polite and were very sorry to disturb you. And, but Mrs. Whoever she was just wanted to convey her thank you to you for your playing because it touched her and she explained it to me. And, and again, you know, I'm like, Oh, what's going on here and if it had only happened once okay but it happened three times so it got me thinking what's language like russian german english japanese what is language it's some kind of transport uh, middle transport medium medium it's a transport medium so good you can do german <laughs> i've been over here too long <laughs> And the basic message though, is it's, it's a layer underneath. It's like the, the machine language with computers. It's right, underneath. and that, that's a superb analogy. That's a wonderful yeah. analogy, I like that. Yeah. And so I, I was like, what the hell is going on here? Here's an Australian in a, in a German orchestra in Japan playing Austrian music thinking some thoughts and thinking it might have an effect on the audience, putting out a, a, an affirmation for them. And there are people coming back, talking with me about it afterwards. And, and um, yeah, it, I mean, it really got to me. And, and so I did a lot of reading about what's going on there. And it's interesting now with COVID times, because I think these days we are far more connected with one another uh, one of the therapy things when you ask about it is um, matrix re-imprinting from Carl Dawson. And part of what he thinks is that um, we, we don't store everything that we experience inside of ourselves, inside our minds, our bodies, and that we store it also in this energy matrix, which is why other people can read it sometimes. It's not conscious, it's subconscious. And he's developed therapy techniques then for dissolving childhood uh, trauma that you've got hanging out there like a bulletin board saying, hey, I, I was sexually abused. Come, come abuse me again, kind of thing. A, a very interesting type of stuff. So I think these days, there's, there's, the more I find out, the more I realize I just got no idea. And the less I know, uh, the less secure I am about it all. And like with the gravity thing, you, you experience something, you realize it, you try it out with other people in master classes and you realize it works. So I figured at some stage, I don't need to know why it works, what the nuts and bolts are. I need to know that it works and I need to know how I can transfer what I know over to other people because to take it from uh, what you were talking, what I was listening to before, it's transformational for them in their lives as things have been for me in my life. So I think out of all of that, the, the thing I love most about being a musician or have loved and still do is the teaching because you're helping somebody else transform their life, you're opening up their minds, helping them to access a little more of their immense potential. And I think most of us don't even have an inkling of how much potential is there. I, I was interested uh, when I was listening to one of your other interviews uh, um, to hear you talk about the languages you speak because I've had problems with it. I can do German and English and I can do both of them very well. And I've spent countless hours trying to learn French, trying to learn Spanish, trying to learn Japanese. And, so, <laughs> and, and I, just, I just ran into a brick wall with all of it. So it was really interesting listening to you. But the question would be, before you started learning that second language, were your, 
what was your understanding your, of your potential to be able to speak different languages? What's it like now? Well, that's a really interesting question. And I, we, we, can, we let's go down. I've, you, you opened up a whole lot of rabbit holes with all that you were talking about before. <laughs> and before I go down the language rabbit hole, which I'm very willing to go down, I just want to highlight one thing that you spoke about, which is forgiveness. Because yeah. in my many decades now practice of qigong and tai chi we yeah. practice the art of forgiveness and almost inevitably when we talk about forgiving the person people need to forgive first is themselves so people hold on to all this stuff of against other people but the art of forgiveness certainly starts with oneself i just wanted to mention that because because it, it really it's it's been a key thing for me as well of learning to forgive myself and it's an on it's an ongoing journey it's an now, ongoing thing. It stops, the languages yeah. it's a funny story because I, I in year seven i don't think i've told this one before in year seven we got to do a term of french a term of italian and a term of german and I was convinced I was terrible at it. I was a loser. I couldn't, I couldn't capture any of it. We did a term of German. <laughs> at the end of it, all I could say, and I can still remember, I had one sentence, ich möchte ein Brief machen zu 30. Or I could say I want a 30 cent stamp. <laughs> that was it. For Italian, I had nothing. For French, I had nothing. And so afterwards, I was convinced for me, Jeff, languages, no, can't do it, cannot do it. Okay, so flash, that was in year seven in 81 or something. Then in 1990, I moved to, uh, moved to Basel and I was learning from Edward Tarr. We spoke English. I had all these Swedish friends. They spoke English with me. So I didn't really learn much. And I was still kind of convinced that I wasn't very good at it. But towards the end of that year, my Swedish friends, they got together and said, well, Jeff, your German's not very good, is it? And I thought, no, it's not. Hmm, maybe I need to do something about that. And so when I got my first job, which was in Hof in Bavaria, I decided, right, enough, that's it. So I lived with a German family and I started this hard shell of myself of demanding they were only, that even though my German wasn't very good and they spoke English, yeah. I just would not listen to English from them. They weren't allowed to speak to me in English. And yeah, that, was how I, that was how I did it. Okay. Not from having a great belief that I could, but just yeah. from deciding I was going to. And then I did the same thing with French and, and all the others. And it followed from that. Uh, Not from any initial uh, feeling that I was good at it. <laughs> but still, the point is, before you started, embarked on that and started experiencing yourself as somebody who can and who does speak different languages and is able to communicate well in different languages, there was this point prior to that where you had no idea about that potential that was going to open up in your life. Definitely. And the major thing for me also is we, we um, it's judgment. We're, we're judging all the time. It's part of being human. It's, it's built in there. I do this every day. The left-hand page is my morning meditation. It's a writing meditation. And I ask myself six questions. The first one is why and how do I choose and expect to be the following kind of a person today? And built into that is forgiveness, being non-judgmental, all of these kind of things that I find difficult, active listening, um, doing what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, disciplined, a whole lot of stuff like that. And then one that came recently from a fantastic book that I can really recommend to everybody. It's called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And the question is, um, what one thing can I do today such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? So I ask myself that question every day and it sets a big boulder for me. One thing that I'm going to do no matter what, come hell high water. The next one comes from clean language, which is also something to really get into for anybody who's interested, developed by um, a New Zealand um, psychologist, David Grove, to help people better overcome trauma, clean language. And the question I use there is, and Andrew, if today goes just as you would like, that will be like what? And his system works on questions like that, that are very open um, and where the facilitator is really only that, they, they don't mix in with your thing. And um, 
that's something that's really helped me enormously. I did it originally. Uh, I, I, I did six sessions with a woman in, in London online um, to, to try and free up some blockages about the joy key, about selling. You know? And when it was over, um, there were actually three major benefits I took from it, from this type of questioning. And one was my relationship with my wife that was already good just went like this. It's just fantastic. The second one was some of this fog from the focal dystonia, from the messed upness lifted. And the third one was the joy key went on okay. Um, then I, I have a question, why and how do I choose and expect to uh, accomplish the following things today? And I, if I write it down, I generally end up doing it. Why and how do I choose to look forward to the following today? And today it was doing this interview with you. Um, why and how do I choose to feel joy about something today, whatever it is? And um, the, th the last one is why and how do I choose to and where can I make a difference in someone's life today? So it gets my brain scanning for opportunities. This whole thing sets up a day for, for creating opportunity and of course creating momentum um, one of the things in there is another book, uh, The Five Second Rule, which is really fantastic. There's a woman who was midlife crisis and she uh, she watched in the middle of the night when she couldn't sleep a, a rocket starting and it was five, four, three, two, one, go and up went the rocket. And she thought, I'll try that next morning. She's lying in bed. I don't feel like getting out. Five, four, three, two, one, get up. She got up and she was like, what am I doing? It's cold. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. She got dressed and did what she needed to do. And I found that to be an incredible lever in my life since I've known about it. And in the evening, um, and this is where this journal started, I did a course about money and this guy said to me, I'll give you a tip. Before you go to bed, write down three things that you're grateful for from the day. So all of this originally started down out with me just writing down three things that I was grateful for and it evolved into this. So the question in the evening is why and how do I choose to be grateful for and appreciative of the following things in my life? And I write at least 10, sometimes 15, sometimes 20. Why and how do I choose to acknowledge and praise myself for the following things today? We musicians, we live in a world of too sharp, too flat, too loud, too soft, too early, too late. And, and it's all always in this negative thing. And so when a conductor comes along, you'll have experienced this, a conductor comes along and they don't talk like that at all. They say, I imagine here like a bark going or a, a, you know, a, river, a river doing this, or they paint a picture for you. And then, then they get a hundred people marching in the same direction. And all of a sudden, everybody in the orchestra is having fun and saying, wow, isn't this good? Um, a great way to, you know, yeah, it, it's an amazing experience when that happens. So, It 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 um, it locks us in this to this to that, and but always thumbs down, always. So I found this a major, and actually, a, a, an Australian colleague came years and years in the eighties. He came for a concert where Bowman was honoured in in um, Essen, um, and he came back afterwards for lessons, and he was with me for two weeks, and I. He had this incredible energy, the way he came. So I, I had this feeling he's bringing me a message. After he had left, it took two weeks. And then all of a sudden, and I'm asking myself, what, what was it? What was it about? And we had this lesson. He played the beginning of Strauss 1. And he'd been down on himself. Anytime we talked, you know, this is no good and that's no good. And a real real Australian twang and twang about it also, which added to it, you know. And so I tripped him up. I asked him, Graham, what was good about what you just played? Oh, well, you know, and I said, no, no, what was good about it? And I looked at my watch, it took him five minutes and the sweat broke out here. And finally he said, I got all the notes. I said, yeah. As a horn player, that's a really good thing. Get all the notes as a horn player, man. You know, we're out on the industry. And then I asked him, and what do you want to add? And all of these things that he had stored up as negative comments were suddenly like dominoes 
and little goals that he wanted to add. And when I realized that um, behind me on the wall, you, you can see um, over this shoulder, whichever, what's the right shoulder, there's a picture up there with Mr. Harnancourt. And I used to have a big poster up there in pink. What was good about what I just played and what do I want to add? Years later, I discovered a book from Shad Helmstetter about self-talk. I remember reading about it in a, in a restaurant in, in Geneva and being shattered because I knew some of this stuff and then you forget it and then somebody else comes along and reminds you of it again. So I had that poster up there for seven years and I had my music stand looking at it for three. I had it looking over my shoulder for another four and I've used it with teaching ever since. I will not let people criticize themselves. And I really try to point out the fact how they do it and how destructive it is. And that you, you learn much quicker and you get much better results when you're kind to yourself. The older I get, the more I realize how important kindness is, being gentle with yourself, with others. And so this daily acknowledging and praising of oneself, it's really, really, really important. Coming back to the three books, and I'm on to another book now from Joe Dispenza. Um, it's about recreating yourself, how you think of yourself. And he, it, it's, it's a, a step further than evolve your brain, evolve your brain's talking what it's about and then a critical accident he had and where he helped highly, uh, heal himself spinal injuries big it's a great book to read evolve your brain and this one's about how to use it for yourself to get different results and so coming back to the potential none of us knows what potential's in us and the best thing about all the books and i was thinking also about one other thing i wanted to mention a guy called bob proctor it's a course from bob proctor that i bought for a lot of money um called You Were Born Rich. And what he's saying is we are all born rich in potential. And it's an incredible program. And at the end of it, he um, has, he, he shows you that in the audience, there are people from his business, family people. It's a very warm audience for him. And he gets one of his son-in-law actually to come down and shows him something and asks him, what is that? The guy doesn't know. So he explains to him, it's a metal toothpick. And he said, so we've just grown his brain a little bit. When he goes home, he's going to have a little bit bigger brain than when he came here. But the thing for me that he talked about that I like to use, especially in our industry is, um, creating growing cells of recognition as a as a musician when you or, or as a human being when you come to a new language a new musical language a new language in, in in the sense of spanish italian whatever else at the beginning we don't have any cells of recognition in here and we have to do some hard work to set up perimeters to set up reference points and this kind of thing once you're on your way it gets easier and easier and easier so I guess the, the, the biggest thing out of all of this and with these books is the, it's, it's like a, a, a number lock. Asking the right kind of questions is finding out the right numbers in the right sequence. When you do, it's really easy to open the lock. And we work hard in our practice rooms, we work hard in our cells and whatever else. And then we go out there and there's always this question, am I good enough? Is it gonna be good enough? It's the wrong kind of question. We should be going out there, I think, asking, so how can I experience this as, and whatever you wanna experience it as? And our brains, they, they love the questions and they don't care though, what kind of question you ask. So. If the question, am I good enough? Who knows? Do, what, what do you want to feel? Do you want to feel you're good enough or not good enough? It's sort of swimming with it. If you don't want to feel you're good enough and you ask that question, you go out on stage and you'll perform in such a way that you can come off and say, yeah, I'm not good enough. You can ask different questions though. Prepare your mind differently and go out with a different set of expectations. Enjoy it far, far more. Give the audience far more and come off and say, cool. 
and how can I add on to what I learned today? What was good about what I did and how can I add on to it? So that's kind of where I'm evolving to at the moment. And, and coming into it, um, there's one other person who's not a cellist who played a huge A, and I've never met him personally, unfortunately, um, a guy named Peter Ralston, R-A-L-S-T-O-N. One of his books is called Chen Hasin. It's a martial arts thing. And the subtitle is The Principles of Effortless Power. And the book, I think, is priceless for brass players. Really, absolutely priceless, because we have this, if we don't do it well, we have this limitation here. And if we do do it well, um, then you can do it the way Doc Severinsen does. He's 91 and he's still out the front there, you know, knocking it out. It's incredible. It's really amazing. And what's the difference between Doc and other people? It's his work ethic and the way he thinks about himself. Wow, Andrew. Now, a few things that are really good news. One bit of good news is that I looked on your website and nearly all the books that you've referenced today are there. And so I will link that in the comments for this for this interview so people can can find them all because I, I recognize that nearly all of them as you were talking when I was ah, cool. on your website. The Good. other thing that I really want to highlight is the similarities between what you've been talking about and what I got out of my own martial arts and yoga and meditation, the pillars of letting go, yeah. the art of forgiveness, the art yeah. of gratitude. Absolutely. And what's now so important for me as an educator, a strength-based approach. Because when I came up, it, the strength-based approach wasn't there. It was more of what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I yeah. do believe that a strength-based approach, and you can still improve things with a strength-based approach. A strength-based approach doesn't mean it's already fantastic. It just means no. you acknowledge what's great. And as you so eloquently said, what can I do to make it greater? And... What I think is really important, this idea, which is another part of being transformational, what can I do to make it better for other people? And that was yes. in your Japan message when you were yes. practicing the, the Mala Five and when yeah. you're in one of, your, one of your morning routines is what can you do for other people? I think yes. that the selfless um, attitude in life yeah. can go. So it's so fascinating for me to hear your journey to come to some, a lot of our conclusions are very, very similar through a completely that's different I, path. That's what I tweeted when we first talked and, and when I was listening to some of your stuff and I thought, oh, I got to get to know this guy. So I'm really pleased we're having this conversation. Yeah. And I'm pleased that this conversation will be shared by, you know, by many other yeah. people. Now, I do have a, 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 a final question that I sometimes ask and I am going to ask it of you. It was, it was inspired by my good friend, Fabian Russell, whose interview will be coming out later on. And what music would you like to have performed at your funeral? <laughs> Interesting. The thing that came into my mind immediately was a Bach cello suite. I'm not so good. Which one? Yeah, probably the first, the first movement of the first. It'd be enough. It'd be, uh, yeah. Beautiful. Do you know, although, do you know sorry? Although the, the, the piece that, that um, pacified me when I was still in Australia, still, you know, like wild, like, like a, a cut rattlesnake, wild, wild, wild. I, I used to get very drunk and very out of control. And people who knew me well knew to put on the fifth mile of with Dale Clevenger playing first horn. And if they put that on, it didn't matter what mood I was in, how I was ram rampaging or whatever, I'd just sit down and listen. So may may maybe it should be the fifth mile. <laughs> well, you know, it'll be, it'll be a giant festival so we can have both. <laughs> we can have both. Yeah. Andrew, what an absolute pleasure for me to be able to not just to, to get to know you like this, but to know that I'm going to share this. And I'm sure that this is going to be one of the ones that I'm going to watch repeatedly. And I'm sure many of uh, the audience will as well. So I just want to say a huge thank you. And I'm going to say farewell to the audience.
Thank you so much. My great pleasure and greetings to the audience. And uh, also, you know, if people are, are, are interested in finding out more, if they've got questions or whatever, they're very welcome just to contact me. Uh, the details are on the website or it's, it's easy to get in contact with you or over Facebook, whatever. Uh, I'm very happy to share the stuff. Um, it's all good stuff. There's amazing stuff out there. And I know just, you know, like this stuff that's been relevant for me, but yeah. And I will certainly share your website when I, when I share the, when I share the, the video, I'll make very clear. Thank you so much.